Thank you, ladies and gentlemen voters, audience, and especially Tiffany, who really helped us out this year with getting on the ballot and getting things done. So as you heard, we are coming before the people in our district to ask for a mill levy increase. So we need to give you a little history about our district. In 1952, the effort was started as the people in the Animas Valley began to form a special district for mosquito control. Eight years later, in 1960, the Animas Mosquito Control District was formed. Those uh, who laid the foundation to bring the district, uh, the oldest metropolitan mosquito control district in the state of Colorado into existence, merit special recognition. History has proven that they were wise and farsighted and made the district be as wise and as it continues to update and grow. The Animus Mosquito Control District is charged with controlling the mosquito population to protect the health and comfort of the people, pets, livestock, and wildlife. Mosquitoes carry and transmit diseases. Some of these diseases are West Nile, dog heartworm, Zika virus, encephalitis, and dengue, uh, to name a few. Anybody in here have dogs? We all have dogs. You don't want dogs to get dog heartworm? Okay, it's very nasty, so be sure that you take the dog to your vet and get them taken care of. In our district alone, we have 21 species of mosquitoes. Of the 21 species, we have 15 that are known vectors, which means they carry these diseases that I just mentioned to you. The district strives to upgrade the quality and safety of its products in order to provide the most environmentally friendly and human and animal safe products to control the mosquito population. There has been a steady rise in costs associated with treating the district due to several factors. Number one, significant climate fluctuations experienced in recent years, including the high level of moisture experienced in 2019 or 2018 and 2019. Number two, continually increase in housing development. Number three, increase in product use and costs. Uh, uh, including going organic certification expense, number four, raising labor need and costs, and five, uh, necessity uh, facility upgrades. The mill levy increase was in, the last one we had was in 2003, at which time it was 0.99. Uh, we're asking to go to the point, or 1.4. This would, would provide the revenue to cover the increased cost AMCD has experienced over the last several years and is expected to experience in the future. The difference in the cost to the residential owners would be about $2.93 per year per, per 100,000 of actual value. Significant climate fluctuations such as the high level moisture experienced in 2018 and 19 and causing the river flooding and changes to the water level along the riverbanks, forcing a higher use of product and time to control mosquito larvae. So if you don't understand that, it was this year we had the actual, the river came up and went down two great significant times. When that goes down, what it ends up leaving for us is pools of water everywhere. And in those pools, of course, are mosquito larvae. So we no more get that control than bingo, here comes the flood again, washes that product out, and the minute it goes back down again, we have to go back along the riverbanks and can continually take care of that. And if you live in the valley or know anything about the valley, every time that happens, the water also subsides and comes up to the ground all along the highway. So it goes up and down, causing us to go back and take our product and treat it. So those factors really do affect us, so this year really hammered us. The, uh, <clears throat> The combined with the warmer temperatures this season resulted in eight West Nile positive pools in our district. What that means is we have a 50 mile square radius that we take in. We take in all the valley, all of the city of Durango. And in that we have 17 of what we call our live traps. I don't know if any of you have ever seen them out. They hang and these are to trap adult mosquitoes and flyers that come out at nighttime and we have a guy that sets those and then goes out and checks those and brings those in. We also have our own lab where we have a gal that takes those mosquitoes in the day and she sorts through them, identifies them, and then we put them in vials that we take out to San Juan Basin Health and they send those to Denver to be tested for West Nile. And of those this year, those 17 traps we had out, we had eight that tested positive for West Nile. 
So when the testing for, test positive for West Nile happens, we go right back in to that area where, the, where our traps were, and we go ground first, take our guys in there, and we're looking again for standing water and areas where those mosquito larvae might be producing. Then we come in in the evening, and that's what we do. Basically, we start with our fogging, and we do those trying to kill the, the adult flyers that are out. <clears throat> So we haven't had that kind of show since 2016 was the last time we had actually West Nile from our testing and from the state. So we've been pretty good. But when I talked to the gal in Denver this year, she uh, told us that it wasn't just us in the Four Corners. All of the state of Colorado was getting hit again this year with West Nile. We contribute that, we're thinking a lot to the moisture we had from last winter. And then again, we went to real hot temperatures this year. So. That's what we're blaming it on. <clears throat> in terms of the housing development, uh, where the district was previously treating 102 acre, 100 to 200 acre ranchettes, the district now treats subdivisions. When I first started on over eight years ago, the valley was still a lot of farmland. Now that farmland is subdivisions. When you go in there, those subdivisions can be one home or they can be 15 or 20 homes. So now my people who used to go in and just treat a hay field area, now I have to treat a subdivision. In those subdivisions, most people want ponds, they have water features, they have rain barrels, they have tires, they have wheelbarrows, they have kiddie pools, and the list goes on and on that we have to go out and check for standing water. So it has taken more time for us to cover our whole 50 miles square mile area and check for these areas. <clears throat> It's anticipated that such development will increase due to the continuing house, uh, rise in housing demand. The additional homes create more breeding habitat. When uh, I went to the county and also went to the city within our district, what I found was just in our county, in our district, there was over 600 residences in the last five years that went up. In the city, they were just over a little, a little over 600 also. So that's 1,200 homes in the last five years that have taken away farmland and et cetera or vacant lots that now we have to take care of. Environmental concerns and new technologies have increased the cost to adequate and train our, our qualified employees. Once acquired and trained, the district must remain competitive in terms of compensation and benefits in order to retain that specialized labor. Labor shortages and the high cost of living in the area continue to increase such costs. Due to the increased workload from a rise in housing, there's a need for at least two additional crew members for an AMS Mosquito Condole District. The district is facing costly upgrades to its current facility, additional employees along with the need to store additional environmental, environmental with required immediate expenditures, the cost of upgrading equipment, and shop supplies to keep peace with advances in the industry as an additional ongoing challenge for us. So that's basically why we're asking for an increase. On 6C, we're asking, we have two board members this year that are up for term limits, so we're asking also that everybody would vote and allow they, them to stay in. It's to do away with that term limit. Uh, it's hard to find people that can even have time or would get on a board and these people have spent a lot of years on our board and, and know the situation. And also with our employees, it takes uh, about two years to take our employees around to where we know all the mosquito holes are, all the little areas. So it takes about two years to get those people trained and know where those areas are. And so that really runs into a problem too because we're a, a seasonal and to find qualified people to stay with us, it also becomes a concern. So, that is us. Any questions? Yes, sir. How many people do you employ? Right now we have six. We have two crews of two people. One starts on the southern end, one starts on the northern end. We try to work together, and then depending upon what the river does or whatever weather conditions we have, uh, then myself and, and the gal that's in the office, she's not only our office manager, she's also our last tech. She and I go out and make up and have a call in between. So that's why we're asking for the additional two people. Anything else? Yes? To follow up on, on his question, um, so what do you do in the winter months? I'm sorry? What do you, so I'm presuming that the, the workload is in the spring through 
No, ours are all Steve. They're the only full-time employees is myself and, and the gal that does the <coughs> office manager and the lab because we, we have all the paperwork we have to do for the state and the federal government through the wintertime. And then we have, uh, you cannot believe the folks that have moved here and have gated communities and chains for gated lock communities. So we have to get all the gate codes. So it's a continual process every year to get all that information and keep a book on it and phone numbers and where they are. A lot of them don't even live here. They only come here once or twice a year. So it's an ongoing process of that too. We've gone also to using GPSs that our crews go out and they go out in the morning, they load their truck. Everything as far as product, we have to stay within the label. We just don't go out and throw stuff and happy are we, we have to stay within the guidelines of those, the products that we use. So in the morning they have to fill out sheet, they also put it in their GPSs. Wherever they stop that day, they're also required to, any larva that they find, they put them in tubes and they have to label on the tube where it was, the, the conditions, hot, sunny, warm, what the temperatures were. Then we bring those larvae in and the same gal that does the, the flyers also identifies these larvae, okay? So we have tubes of those that come in every day along with the paperwork and, and the control on the GPS of where our product's going and how much is going out there on the land. Yeah? Um, how would a resident know if they were in the district? We have a, a map, you can go to our website. Our website shows our whole area. Uh, our sister company is Florida Mesa. She's on the east side of us. She runs from Farmington Hill down into Three Springs and then they go over over east. Uh, Fort Mayfield and Ignacio has nothing. She sometimes contracts out. You know, she did this year too because everybody had so many mosquitoes. So she did some contracting out into Mayfield to try to help those folks in Mayfield. We had one West Nile positive on a human being that came out of, out of Bayfield this year. One more question. Yes. The town I grew up in bred the local bats with super duper mosquito eating bats and never had a problem after that. So I'm wondering if you looked at that and how it's looking your product is. We have, we've, we've had a lot of people that are really pro bat boxes and bats. We have a lot of people that are pro using Gambesi fish. And what we have found that they put, they have put them in their ponds and et cetera. And what we find is they end up calling us anyway. The bats and the Gambesi fish still do not eat enough larva and et cetera to where it controls the influx of mosquitoes. What everybody forgets is we live in a complete forest service area. So no matter how well we do down here in the city in the valley, controlling so you're not getting bit at night in, your, in our district, these still keep coming in every day on wind and turbulences and et cetera. So the mosquitoes never go away. They're always there. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you, Pat. Next is ballot issue. 6D, shall the Southwest La Plata Library District be formed and shall property taxes be imposed beginning in 2021 at a rate of 1.5 mills to provide services which may include maintaining, improving, and expanding library services and facilities, increasing hours of operation, and providing enhanced library services and operations, such as buying new books and media and improving programs for children, teens, and adults. And shall the district be entitled to collect, retain, and spend those revenues, notwithstanding any limitation or restrictions under table or any other law? And I will remind you, this is about 3,800 uh, registered voters in this library district. Cynthia Lobig and Rebecca Benali are here to fill in the details and answer your questions, and we're going to take about just a few more minutes. like to start with a little history just like Cap did. <laughs> um, Fort Lewis, Mesa, and Sunnyside have historically been rural ag agricultural communities, both designated below the poverty income level. While Durango Public Library serves all the residents of Durango and La Plata County, 
Rural residents often find themselves constrained by time, distance to Durango, and costs involved in traveling to town. That is where rural branch libraries have filled an educational, social, and cultural vacuum, becoming true beacons of learning and social connections for all ages. Fort Lewis Mesa opened as a branch library in 1981, and Sunnyside opened in 1992 as a branch library to provide expanded resources for residents living in these communities. From the beginning, each of these libraries has filled a huge need, providing enrichment opportunities to families and community members not able to take advantage of the offerings of the main library in Durango. Books, periodicals, audiobooks, movies, story time and activities, computer access are the regular fare at both library branches. Computer usage is a huge benefit to patrons in both communities, as many families are unable to afford home internet access or don't have it due to unreliable connectivity or lack of broadband service. Both branches offer a selection of audio or, visu video or video resources for learning as well as home entertainment since the internet speeds and connections are spotty in these rural areas. Each library expands upon a variety of learning and social activities unique to their local populations. These branch locations serve as gathering places for community groups such as 4-H, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, music groups, boys and girls club activities, after school organizations, destination imagination, and community book clubs, to name just a few. In 2017, over 8,000 people visited the Sunnyside Branch Library. Over 5,000 people visited Fort Lewis Mesa. Between two library, the two libraries, over 13,000 items were checked out to community members, and almost 4,000 people participated in community events at these libraries. For almost 30 years, the county has funded Durango's branch libraries with general funds from their operating budget. Two years ago, they decided to stop funding the public libraries located within Sunnyside and Fort Lewis Mesa Elementary Schools. Durango School District 9R stepped in and helped keep the libraries going with money from grant funds for rural schools. Unfortunately, the school district is no longer in the position to financially support the public libraries. It's important to mention that even though the school district cannot financially support the libraries, they still provide a significant amount of physical support. They provide space to house the library's collection of books, DVDs, and other materials. They provide the utilities and maintenance required for those spaces. They allow the public access to their buildings after school hours and during the summer months so that everyone can use the libraries. 9R plans on continuing this support. In a resolution adopted at a school board meeting on August 13th, 2019, they said, Now therefore, be it resolved by the school board of the Durango School District 9R in the county of La Plata and state of Colorado. The board has determined and hereby determines that the interest of the district and the public interest and necessity demand and require that the district participate in the library district as above stated. The district's participation in the library district shall be subject to the county's formation of the library district and voter approval of a property tax levy sufficient to compensate necessary library staff and to operate and maintain the library facilities. All acts, orders, or resolutions, or parts thereof in conflict with this resolution are, re are repealed. So as far as the ballot goes, starting in early 2019, Two groups of citizens in the communities who use these libraries started trying to secure a reliable source of funding to keep the libraries open. They searched for grant money, but found that most grant organizations will not provide funding for staffing or other administrative programmatic operations. The two groups joined together in the spring and determined that the only way to guarantee continued access to our libraries was to put a measure on the ballot for taxpayers to decide if they value the libraries enough to commit to supporting it through a property tax. A petition signed by 345 registered voters from the district was submitted to the La Plata County Commissioners to put the measure on the ballot. The proposed library district was defined to best represent the two committee communities most likely to use and support the libraries. Uh, you can see it on the map that's um, up on the display here. 
And the, the description of the district is all of La Plata County voting precinct 11, all of La Plata County voting precinct 29 within the Southern Indian Reservation, except the subdivision known as Trapper's Crossing at Durango, all of La Plata County voting precinct 21, portions of voting precincts 32, 29, and 22 that are included in the Sunnyside Elementary School attendance area, but outside of the Durango city limits. And additional area within voting precinct 32, south of County Road 220, west of Highway 172, uh, and west of County Road 307, shall be known as the Southwest La Plata Library District. Ballot Measure 6D will create and fund the Southwest La Plata Library District. The funding from this measure will pay for the operational costs, materials costs, programming costs, and other costs associated with running a library. As I'm sure you're aware, it costs money to run libraries. There are the obvious costs like personnel, materials, and building and maintenance costs. Then there are the costs we don't usually think of, like liability insurance, technology costs and upgrades, event and programming costs, and more. Luckily, when we all pull together, our community can have access to thousands of books, hundreds of movies, audiobooks, and more for about the same price to each household each year as two DVDs. When this measure is passed, we will be able to keep the libraries open. The funding will support staffing, books, audiobooks, movies, computer and internet access programming, such as summer reading programs, after school enrichment for school children, meeting space for local organizations and more. A major advantage to having our own library board is that the board can quickly respond to taxpayers who are funding the library. For example, people have suggested that the libraries, uh, uh, that the libraries be open six days a week instead of four. Others have asked that we restore after school programming that was cut from the, from the budget in 2019. With the local control that we will have after the district is formed, we will take steps to accommodate these requests, or the board will. The district board will be comprised of taxpayers from within the district, ensuring responsive and fiscally responsible management of the libraries. There will be transparency about how the tax dollars are utilized. People will be able to attend the board meetings, apply to be a board member, and make requests to and recommendations directly to the board. Our libraries are more than just books. They provide internet access to rural areas of the county where private internet access can be unreliable. They are welcoming places for everyone, regardless of age, education, income, or culture. They host many programs that help unify, strengthen, and positively impact our communities. They provide local, convenient public meeting places, they provide materials and support for a variety of patrons, including homeschool families, early language learners, English language learners, and senior citizens. The Sunnyside Library and the Fort Lewis Mesa Library are incredibly affordable facilities that offer countless benefits to our communities. Please help us keep these vital assets open and available to our rural citizens. Are there any questions? I'd like to know who's going to control the funds once they're uh, The question is who will control the funds uh, once that are collected for the district. Uh, there, so there's a board of directors that will be appointed by the county commissioners and it's going to be made up of citizens from within the district and uh, they will appoint, is it five, five members? Uh, I think it's still being discussed whether it will be five or seven members, but an odd number so that, you know, we don't have trouble with ties. So I and just want to be clear, because this is an important issue to me. Yes, ma'am. So the county commissioners who shut the libraries down will actually control the money once again to keep them open. They will appoint the, the board members? They will appoint the board members, but the board is very very committed, the, well, the people who have applied to be on the board, there's no board yet, but we are passionate about keeping our libraries open, running efficiently, having good people in place to run the programs and to manage, and we, I, I believe it's fair to say that we, <laughs> not as a board, but we will be having our voice to say, please use the money frugally and effectively. 
And, and just to be clear, the board is made up of, uh, in order to be on the board, uh, you apply to be on the board, and then the county commissioners decide from people who have applied to be there um, which ones to appoint. And once the board exists, they can create bylaws to govern how those positions are filled subsequent to the formation of the board. It will not be an independent district, yes. It is an independent, independent from other libraries in the area. Is that the question? Or? The question is, the board won't control it. The county commissioners will steal from the board. No, I don't I think so. speak to this thing? Sorry. Can, we might need you to... I think what we need to have is... Uh, can you respond to this question? Yes, I believe so. Okay, so but once the county commissioner chooses the board from the applicants who submitted their applications, then the board takes over and runs everything, including okay. the finances. But those funds are being passed for the library, so the county cannot use those funds for anything else. Would you like to repeat that if you agree with that yes. so, so it can be on... Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That, so, so the, yes, is who's yes. ultimately going to control the, those funds? Yes, the, the, um, our help from Nona Dale was that the, the, the district board will control the funds that are collected for the district. Once the commissioners appoint that initial board, it is the vision from there on out there's a different way they are appointed, or is it the commissioners appoint the board Correct. I don't think we have the answer to that question until the board is set and then the bylaws will be set and then, so I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to That's that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know how much it's going to cost each homeowner for $100,000? So uh, 1.5 mils, um, the, best, the best way to answer that as an example is uh, Oh boy! Uh, <laughs> if if the if the assessed value of your home is two hundred thousand dollars or your property, then um, how do how do we? There's an assessment ratio, tax ratio, and that currently is about six point nine percent. We round it to seven for simplicity. I think that that was the number. So so the actual tax assessment value of your property will be approximately twenty one well I don't have the number on <laughs> yeah. So for a property I valued between two and three hundred thousand dollars, it's gonna be about thirty dollars a year. There we go. I like the way she answers. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Okay. That's much easier okay. than my answer. All right. <laughs> We'd like to thank you both Do, very much. Oh, we no, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought. Do we, we have time for one more question. Peter, did you have a question? No, it was One thing I would like to bring up, because it seems to be the question is board stuff. Because we're a special library district, we're under the statute of Colorado for libraries, which is very controlling. Could you repeat that? Uh, yes, uh, Nona was just pointing out that the the district will be under the, how did you say that? The statute. We'll be operating under the statute of the Colorado library statute. So there are a lot of very specific restrictions that the district will be having to answer to. Um, to the state of Colorado library district statute. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you for the time. Oh. <laughs> and now we're going to move on to uh, our school board district candidate forum. School boards are incredibly important everywhere, but they are most, perhaps, important in Colorado. Rather than establishing a centralized, state-administered system such as most, almost all states have, Colorado's constitutional framers created a public school system in Colorado intentionally committed to local control. That local control has continued from 1876 to this day. Practically speaking, local control of instruction 
translates into 178 school boards across this state having the ability to make decisions on issues such as curriculum, personnel, budget, school calendars, classroom policy, and strategic vision. Strategic vision having become much more important in the 21st century. So all school board elections are important. Your school district has 28,519 registered voters. Three incumbent members, Nancy Stubbs, Mick Souter, and Sherry Bird, are not up for election and remain as incumbents. In District D, incumbent Mariana Valdez, who was appointed to fill a vacancy, is not seeking election. That seat will be filled by appointment as no candidates came forward. But tonight, in District B, incumbent uh, Stephanie Moran is, running, Moran is running for another term, and candidate Kristen Smith is running in the district, which is the western side of the city and the western side of the county. The general format for today's forum is as follows. Each of our candidates has two minutes for an opening statement, one minute to answer questions, and two minutes for a closing statement. Uh, Lori Menninger, lady in green here, is really in charge from now on, flashing the cards to keep the candidates on time. So for District uh, B, we have Stephanie Moran and Kristen Smith. Please join me now. Now, please refrain from clapping or cheering or otherwise exclaiming until our candidates conclude their closing remarks, and then we'll give them a rousing vote. And although each has a 50% chance, we will still draw for who, we still do for who opens first, and who got it? Stephanie. <laughs> so, so Stephanie is first, and she will have two minutes, uh, followed by Kristen. Thanks to everyone for being here tonight. I appreciate the confidence that you've had in me to elect me twice, and I ask you to vote for me once more. When I was appointed to the board in 2012, we faced a very serious financial deficit, and our most critical job, which was hiring a new superintendent, Dan Snowberger. He balanced the budget without sacrificing academic and other key programs at our 12 schools, spread over almost 1,700 square miles. We have restructured the teacher's salaries so that they can choose opportunities to forward their careers and their paychecks based on their interests and strengths. Classified employees now earn a living wage based on La Plata County's rate. We partner with our three charters and share our mill levy funds because all of our taxpayers contribute. And we believe that all students deserve the best education they can get at the school that brings out their best. My seven years experience with 9Rs academics and assessments, budgets, and my ability to work effectively with the board all helped me to be a strong leader. As a reasonable person with decades of a career in teaching, I have no extreme or hidden agenda. We face crucial issues of funding and caring for our most in need students, from our gifted and talented to our students with intellectual and developmental disabilities and everyone in between. We must assure that all of our schools are safe for every student, every teacher, every staff member, and attract and retain the best educators and staff. And that's no small task with um, current housing prices. I look forward to working with the superintendent and fellow board members and with all of you to tackle these tough but solvable challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moran. Ms. Smith. Good evening, Durango community members. My name is Kristen Smith. I'm thankful for this opportunity to run for the Durango 9R School Board and for the chance to speak to you tonight. My passion for education began as my son Asher, who has special needs, began school. I became curious about educational practices and I jumped right into the classroom to help and learn. I began to see that Asher and his peers benefited from Asher's inclusion in the classroom. I became an advocate for inclusive education. I firmly believe that all students have strengths and that all students can succeed. In addition to my classroom involvement, I have served the school district in other ways in the past seven years. As Needham PTO President, Miller Middle School PTO Vice President and Secretary, on the BOCES Special Education Advisory Committee, and as the leader of the Juniper Parent Action Committee. I've also completed the first ever Leadership 9R courses and learned a lot about the 9R School District. I thoroughly enjoy working with Durango students, teachers, educators, and parents. I enjoy serving the community in other ways as well as board president of the Adaptive Sports Association and as a volunteer for the Red Door Youth Group. I have been working with students aged preschool to college age as a volunteer my whole adult life. 
have a background in communications with a Bachelor's of Arts in, uh, from Whitworth University. This education has been a valuable tool in communicating with parents, teachers, and educators in our schools. I currently work in home health and am passionate about the physical and mental health of our Durango community and students. I have a husband, Bo, and two children, Asher and Eden, who are middle school and high school students, and I love the Durango community. I'm eager to continue serving our students, teachers, and educators in all of our schools. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Smith. Uh, Ms. Moran, can you move your mic a little bit closer to you, or you a little bit closer are to Are you mic? sure? That's fine. Okay, we're going to begin with the questions now, and the first question is going to start, going to start with Ms. Smith. Please describe what you know about the district's financial status. What familiarity do you have with the school budgets? Sure, I have reviewed the school budgets. Of course, in public education, we never have enough money to do all the things that we want and desire to do and that we want to provide for our students and our community. Um, it's a really tough situation to come up with a balanced budget. We are always seeking more opportunities con to connect in our community with different community resources for supports um, in our finances. Um, there are various programs that have helped with certain issues in our schools, like Mana Soup Kitchen has provided a backpack program for our students to provide tr nutritious snacks and supplemental food for the weekends um, for our students who are without food in those moments. Um, I believe in working in community partnerships to come up with creative and innovative ideas as to how to provide for all of the needs of our various students in our community and our teachers and educators. Uh, thank you, Ms. Smith. Ms. Moran on the district's financial status and budgets. I, uh, we're in good shape of the seven years that I've been on the uh, board. Six of our seven uh, budgets have come in uh, at or below where they are supposed to. We've had only one year where we've had any major issues with our auditor, and that was mostly about deadlines. Um, again, I worked pretty closely with the board in 2012 and 13 when we had a $1.2 million deficit. Um, my recollection is we only had to cut one family program from Escalante Middle School, and I was sorry to do that, but we were, uh, were in good shape. We have about $57 million um, budget. It's not enough. I don't know what you guys know about the, what I call the tentacles of Tabor, and maybe that'll come up again a little bit later. But we spend, even though our economy is anywhere between number one and number seven, in the country, we spend $2,700 less than the average uh, in this country on education. That's a disgrace. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that's kind of difficult is to, to randomly choose when you only have two people. <laughs> so we're gonna be going back and forth, but I am gonna go right back on you, Ms. Moran, with the next question. What is your position on giving students partial lunches if they have a balance of it? Okay, so this came up. I was not, I was unaware that the same um, system we had last year is still there. It, the very last paragraph says, if you have any issues with um, being able to pay, talk to us. I'd, I'd kind of like to flip that, number one, and say if you have any challenges. Number two, I come from a family of eight kids. Uh, we lived out in the country. I went to school hungry sometimes because the milkman hadn't come, so there wasn't milk for the cereal. So this is wrong because when kids come, if they come hungry, they can't learn. They're going to be hungry by 10 o'clock, and they're going to have low blood sugar, and then they're going to get angry. And that is a really un unhappy situation for them, their peers, and their teachers. So yes, I promise, I'm, I'm only one of five, but I promise I will take this up. Thank you. Ms. Smith. Yes, this is an a area of great concern for me. I think that student nutrition is directly tied to students' social, emotional health and well-being. If you are not properly, you're not given proper nutrition, um, then you can struggle in the classroom with your social, emotional learning. Um, I truly believe that NINAR can come up with creative solutions on how to we pay for these lunch balances a student in elementary school, middle school, and even for the first two years of high school is unable to get a job and pay for these balances. Um, that needs to be something that we provide for them um, through our school district funds, and I believe that we can come up with creative ways to do that. Um, I think that no student should be offered a partial lunch 
I think that that sets them apart from their peers um, and stigmatizes them. I believe that in inclusive education, in inclusive education, everybody gets the same lunch every day. That's highly important to me, and I'd love to see the district make a change in that area. Thank you. Um, there have been several uh, cards on this same issue, and so I hope that I'm going to state this succinctly enough and we'll get it answered with this one question. This is all related to providing security in 9R schools. Uh, what do you think is the best way to provide security in 9R schools, and what is your position on arming security personnel and or teachers at schools? Uh, I'll start with Ms. Moran. With me? Mm -hmm. So, um, number one, you need to know that we have two um, fora. One happens this Wednesday from 6 to 7.30 at Durango High School. The next is next Tuesday, 6 to 7.30 at Escalante Middle School. This came to us as a resolution in June that I think was a, um, a factor that didn't help because it, it, it gave the community the perception that this was a done deal. It's not a done deal. We are very much going out to the community. Um, I have personally read a stack of material, about 15 articles, and I'm going through and synopsizing. We're not to the point where we can make that decision. We had four law enforcement here last week for our safety linkage, and all four of them said, if you do this, you can only do this, you should only do this with a, an SRO, a school resource officer, who is in fact a member of the police department. School safety. school safety and security is a high priority for me. My children are in those schools, sitting in those seats. Um, my son is not able to escape the building as quickly as other students. Um, so it's something that I think about personally every day. Um, when we talk about arming security guards, um, it's something that I don't think is a great idea. And I take Police Chief Brammer's uh, um, advice on this, that they have highly, highly um, trained people in the police department, in state patrol, at the sheriff's office. Um, I believe that those people, we cannot keep up with that kind of training in the school district. We don't have the funds for that. I do agree with Stephanie that SROs are the way to go. How we're gonna put them into the budget, we've gotta find a way as a community. I believe that that's the way to solve this. It's interesting to hear high schoolers' perspectives on this. High schoolers are not sure that they wanna have security guards with um, weapons on their campus. So that's something that I observed in a meeting at the high school recently. Thank you. Um, I think I'll come right back to you, Ms. Smith, with what are the major issues confronting the 9R school board right now from your perspective? The major issue confronting the school board right now is the security issue. Um, that is something that they intend to, I believe, decide upon within this school year, um, whether or not they will um, allow highly trained um, security guards who have a background in police or military to carry weapons on the campus. Um, so that is something that they are working on. I know that budget is always something that is um, an ongoing process in the school board, that we're always working on our budget um, I think that teacher salaries, ex especially paraeducator salaries, are something that the school board has worked on quite a bit. It's something that, um, according to teachers and paraeducators, um, needs continued work and continued community attention. So I think that those are also challenges to figure out how to meet people's needs and um, give them the ability to afford the cost of living in Durango is a challenge. Thank you, Ms. Moran. We have several really serious issues. I want to remind people that less than 2% of youth homicides happen in school. So we need to not overreact to this and we need to be thoughtful about how we move ahead. We'll be listening to the whole community. We have not decided, we have not voted in an SRO. That is a possibility. But we need to hear from the community and make sure that everybody is on the same page with what the research says about whether an SRO can make a difference in reducing school violence. Uh, for me, the fact that uh, we still have an achievement gap with a lot of our populations, particularly in math and literacy, is an ongoing uh, challenge that we really continue to work on. Uh, I'm concerned about teacher graduates. We've dropped 25% in just uh, in less than 10 years from people graduating from teacher programs. In 2013, we had 23% fewer people going into teacher ed. That's a huge problem for your kids and your grandkids and your great-grands. 
Thank you. I'm going to take just one minute here. It is possible that we had people coming in just as we started coming on air who may have missed a couple of things, and I just want to make sure people understand that we are unable to use a, a question that is directed specifically to one candidate. So they need to be able to be answered by both candidates. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to have to make that clear. Uh, uh, what is your opinion on the turnover of principals that has occurred at Miller? Uh, Ms. Smith? Yeah, so my son has actually been a Miller, Medical, Miller Middle School student um, for three years prior to this school year. Um, he had two principals in his time there, and a third principal has joined the staff this year. Um, when Cito Noon left, um, parents were invited into the interview process, students were invited to um, appoint the new principal and, and hire the new principal. Our input was um, taken. Um, when the next principal came, um, again, uh, parents were consulted and we were allowed to be a part of that interview process and Vicki Trousdale was chosen. Um, this last transition in the Miller Middle School um, principal, to my knowledge, there was no opportunity for parents or community members to give feedback on the transition of that new principal taking um, the principal position at that school. Um, to me as a community member and a parent, that was frustrating. Ms. Moran? I just want to remind us we have 12 schools. We have about 200 employees. We do the very best we can to vet our every employee and every administrative position, but it's difficult to get it right 100% of the time. I can't, I, I know some of the backstory on that. I can't share that because it's a personnel issue. And um, I believe that we, we've done the best that we can to get um, middle school in particular, I feel m myself as a teacher, it is without a doubt the most challenging in terms of some of the issues that come up. Sito left to take care of his parents and then um, um, I don't, I really can't talk too much about um, why the, the last um, principal didn't have a lot of parental input. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go right back to you, Ms. Moran, sure. in this effort to keep it moving. Yeah. Uh, what do you believe are the best practices in literacy? How can the school board support teachers' literacy knowledge? In literacy, um, pretty close to my heart, um, the the statistic still stands that the um, the literacy level of a child is most dependent on the literacy level of his or her mother. So. Um, Literacy is a multifaceted issue. I, I would like to see us working um, as much with adult education for our parents who are low level uh, literacy uh, folks themselves. Um, we need to have what uh, is called visualization and verbalization training. Uh, sometimes people can read what's on the page, but it goes right out their, their head. They don't retain. So we have to teach them how to visualize and make basically little movies in their head. When I say the number five to you, most of you made that number. That's because you visualize. And we need to certainly work with decoding as part of that. Um, but decoding alone will not bring up literacy for all of our students. Uh, dyslexia is a multi-faceted um, situation. Thank you. Literacy practices. Literacy is huge in my home because my son's favorite activity is to read. Um, I recently attended um, the a state board of education member came to present the READ Act. Um, it's a bill that has been renewed with more accountability. Um, the READ Act provides um, curriculum suggestions and a way of teaching literacy to our students. I believe it's something that Nine R School District should look into being a part of. It's something that districts have to apply for, um, but it is a model for reading that has been proven to be successful. I do believe that reading um, needs to be a part of all students' um, day across curriculum. You can read in math, you can read in social studies, and you can read in science, as well as reading in language arts. So I think it's something that we need to implement across curriculum, across all grade levels from K through 12. Thank you. I'm going to do something else that we never do during these forums while we're talking with the candidates on one minute. Uh, but I have a note here from our county clerk, Tiffany Parker, and you are so right, and I'm going to mention it a couple of times. Uh, 
At the end, could you remind voters that we elect the school board at large? The candidates are required to live in the district, but we all vote for them. And that is obviously something that we couldn't emphasize enough. And uh, so I, I'm going to say it one more time, but I thought I'd just do it right there. And that gives you guys a break to go, <sighs> So ever since uh, uh, District 9R stopped using BOCES, special ed services seem to have gone downhill. Are there any plans to change that, Ms. Moran? Uh, no, and I would um, question your uh, idea that seems to have gone downhill. I would like more specifics. I, when, um, uh, if I had our PowerPoint here when we went around and did uh, presentations at three different places, we actually increased uh, resources. We increased our providers. We've spent more time, our providers have been able to spend more time with each individual student. So I would, um, I would ask for specifics because I disagree with that, um, with that assessment. Um, I haven't heard any um, feedback from families and usually we hear from people whether they're happy or angry about a decision that we made. I have not heard from um, the folks in that um, community that they've been unhappy with the services. I feel like we're providing much better services at a, at a better rate. We've been able to use that money for other, to provide other providers. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Smith? As a mom of a special needs student, this, um, this topic is close to my heart. Um, increasing resources does not mean that the resources are working correctly and that they're working to help our students succeed. Um, personally, I believe that BOCES handled tra transitions from school, um, from middle, elementary to middle, middle school to high school. They orchestrated that process. That was a valuable um, tool that the, and service that they provided. We no longer have that. And so our students are left to struggle and or have their parents advocate in those transitions. Um, I do believe that the services that are being provided um, are not always up to um, healthcare codes um, in this, in healthcare, um, you work under somebody's license. We hired PT and OT assistants, speech therapy assistants in our district. Um, they are supposed to be supervised by a therapist. Um, that is not always the case in the classroom, um, in my observation. I do believe it's an area of challenge. We need more parents to speak about this. Um, I recently attended a district advisory committee meeting where I was told that the special ed advisory committee does not report to the board, something I would like to change. Thank you. Um, much has been written lately about the fact that girls are discouraged to excel in science and math subjects, largely by their peers, because they would be unpopular. Is this a problem at 9R, and what do you think of that, Ms. Smith? I believe girls should achieve whatever they want to achieve. achieve. That's what I tell my daughter. If you want to be president, you should be president. If you want to be a rocket, science, rocket scientist, you should be a rocket scientist. Um, I do believe that in the 9R school district, um, we do have um, some challenges with providing educational um, outcomes for girls and boys. I would like it to be more equalized. I would like our science and math um, students to be encouraged to go as far as they can, whether they are female or male. Um, I do believe that um, teachers, in this um, school district um, do provide um, programs and services for students to excel in those areas. Um, if girls are feeling pressured by other students, I'm not sure, I haven't heard about that, um, but I hope that the pressure that they're feeling would be um, a good boost toward academic excellence from their peers. Um. I don't believe that there's any teacher in this district who favors boys over girls in terms of the education that he or she provides. What I do know is that we don't have alignment at all of our elementary schools and at our two middle schools to know that all of those teachers are providing science across the board and math across the board in the same way. It's a little disturbing to me because it's got to be five years ago that I thought we were making more progress on this. Um, so part of the problem is making sure that every one of our schools, that science is taught and taught thoroughly at each of our elementary schools and at our middle schools so that when we feed into our two high schools, girls and boys will come with a strong background. We, like the rest of America, suffer with our math scores. 
and we have worked on it every single year and each year I see different um, approaches. I'm very hopeful about adaptive uh, technology. Um, maybe I'll get a chance to tell you more next time. <laughs> well, you may. Okay. Uh, what have you done or plan to do that will benefit students directly? I'll start with Ms. Smith. Sure, um, one of the things I'd like to do to benefit students directly um, is to improve communication among, amongst our schools in our community. Um, I do believe that if teachers feel like they can communicate with their supervisors and with the board and have input, and we are looking to teachers as the content experts for their input, um, that that is an important and valuable tool that maybe is underutilized in our community. Um, I think that if teachers feel valued and heard, it makes them better teachers and it will make our classrooms better places to learn. Um, I do believe that we need to continue working on educating all students. I think that we have some student achievement gaps in our school district. Um, I believe that there are certain populations of students that we could spend more time and focused energy on providing resources for them so that they can be successful alongside their peers. I do believe that every, every school is important in our school district. We need to work together as a community, um, charter schools, public schools, to um, ensure the success of all of our students. Thank you. Ms. Moran, what have you done or plan to do that will benefit the students directly? Well, I want to talk about leadership teams. All of the leadership teams that we have at each school include teachers, and teachers are, are welcome to um, apply to be part of those. We have interventions in math and literacy at each one of our schools, so we, we're well aware of the gaps and we're working on them. Yeah, we have to remember we do things in six or eight hours, and where is the child going when he or she goes home? Um, I'd like to work a little bit more with the families to make sure that the family environment has a literacy rich and a math or a numeracy rich environment at home. I also want to remind you that we share our mill levies with all three of our charter schools because we believe that they all contribute um, in terrific ways to our students' educations. Thank you. Uh, as noted before, with the exception of a couple of things that I just were too specific for me to figure out how to make them work for both candidates, we have taken the questions and I believe responded to the question. So we're gonna move on to, to your closing statements. And before we move on to your closing statements, I just have a general question for the audience. Do we all understand that this is an at-large election and everyone will have the opportunity to vote for District B? Everyone, thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to go to closing uh, arguments and we'll start with uh, Ms. Smith. Sure. I truly believe in the success of every student, every teacher, and every educator in every school in our school district. Every student matters to me. When we're making policy that directs our curriculum on our school board, and it directs our students' daily life and impacts that, we need to keep every student in mind. I believe every teacher and educator is valuable. They are the content experts, as I mentioned before. When making decisions, we need to include our teachers. I do not believe that our teachers feel that they are heard in this community. We need to be sure we are caring for our teachers as a community and doing the best that we can for them as far as salary and support so that they can care for the hearts and minds of our children. Every school is important to me in this community. Durango has many excellent school choices and I'm proud to live in a community that values school choice. We need to work together, all of the schools, private schools, charter schools, public schools, for the success of all of our Durango students. I'm a passionate and involved parent. I know many of you sitting in this audience, and I would love to have the opportunity to be a parent voice on the Durango 9R School Board. And I thank you for coming this evening and for giving me the time to share with you. Thanks, Ms. Smith. Ms. Moran. What has changed since my being appointed to the board in 2012, and what needs to change? What can I pledge to accomplish? Too many students and others have died from gun violence. Schools must be safe from those who would seek to harm our irreplaceable children, teachers, and staff, or to harm themselves. Right now, 85% of gun suicide attempts end in death, and firearm suicide makes up two-thirds of all gun deaths. Programs like Be Smart Educate Everyone, including families 
whose homes often house many of the weapons that might do harm, about how to secure weapons and teach safety measures to everyone. Technology and social media have pervaded our classrooms. We need to harness their power in ways that both protect our children and expand their knowledge of diverse people, places, and ideas. We need to have the courage to help teachers focus on teaching, not on being electronic cops, and to use technology for its capacity to cut down on tedious paperwork. We need to help students to understand how to stop the unhelpful and unrealistic pressures of social media. I'll raise the question of whether and to what extent cell phones belong in the classroom and solicit feedback from you, just as we're doing with gun safety. Our schools need all kinds of infrastructure and technological updates, and the master planning process is in full swing to analyze each school's particular needs and the best way to move forward to assure that we use taxpayer funds wisely. I will listen intently with the goal of doing the greatest good for the greatest number. Too many 9R students still struggle with math and reading. I'll work with Superintendent Snowberger to use assessment data to strengthen students' skills and make sure that teachers have a voice in how to improve literacy and numeracy for all students. Housing prices have skyrocketed. We will strengthen partnerships with businesses in higher ed which face the same conundrum to find reasonable solutions so that our great educators can find great homes. I pledge to work on these goals and I thank you for showing up tonight. And we here in the audience want to thank uh, both of you very much for coming forward uh, to seek this position on the school board. Please join um, There are, I'm going to allow these guys to just move on and so they can get out of the hot light there if they want, but uh, I want to just conclude with a couple of minutes on the two uh, state uh, ballot issues on this year's ballot and also with information we need to get on air and all out to everyone about voting and the election and the election day and how all that works. So uh, there are two ballot issues on this year's ballot, both referred by the state legislature. Does anyone remember how many ballot initiatives there were on last year's ballot? 13. Good, good, yeah, yeah. So, so both of these were referred by the state legislature. I am going to simply refer to information that came from the blue book with some background information and not the pro and con information on these, and we are not going to consider the pro and con information tonight. But just so we get this out, Proposition CC, retain state government revenue. This allows the state government to retain, spend, and save all revenue collected each year beginning in fiscal year 2019 and 20 as a voter approved change under the Tabor Amendment. Requires that those revenues be spent in three ways for public schools, non recurring expenses, higher education, and transportation projects instead of being returned to taxpayers. You will remember that the Tabor Amendment to the state constitution was passed in 1992. Since that year, in six of 29 budget years, the state has collected revenues above the Tabor limit. Voters in 2005 permitted retention and spending above the Tabor limit for five years. That provision sunsetted. This proposition, if passed, permanently suspends the Tabor limit. If the proposition fails, money above the state revenue limit will continue to be refunded according to the current law. That is Proposition CC. Proposition DD is legalization and taxation of sports betting. This proposal authorize, authorizes sports betting in the state of Colorado, authorizes a 10% tax on the net proceeds through licensed casinos and online uh, betting, and establishes a fund to direct the revenue from the sports betting tax to help fund three things, the state water plan, gambling addition services, and to regulate sports betting. The background on this, in May of 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that allowing only Nevada to conduct sports betting was unconstitutional, and states could decide if they went, want to offer legal sports betting. Since that court ruling, 15 states have created a regulated sports betting market in their state. Of note also, the Southern Ute, uh, Sovereign Southern Ute and Ute Mountain Ute tribes are, are tribal and federally regulated and not affected uh, by this uh, proposition. So the good news about being and doing your informed voter homework this year is that those are the only two propositions. You've already received your blue booklet 
And if you have already tossed your blue booklet, because you just didn't realize it, that's what it was, you can see it online at www.coloradobluebook.com. The League of Women Voter Ballot Issue Pamphlet is out in the back, and it's uh, very readable and excellent and for you, as well as more information about the League. Let's talk about voting. Ballots are going to be mailed to all registered voters on October the 11th. You can complete your ballot, and I will tell you these are much shorter ballots than last year. In most cases, people in, uh, in this school district are going to see one side on the front. Just turn it over to make sure that, it's, that the tax uh, issues are not on the back, because in a few instances, in order to get it on the back, it had to go over to the back. But uh, essentially, this is a, just turn it over and look. Uh, so you can complete your ballot and place it in the mail with one stamp. However, don't mail it after October 28th. And we can't be guaranteed, we know where all of our mail goes. We can't be guaranteed it will arrive by election day. Your ballot has to be at the county clerk's office on election day to be counted. Uh, it doesn't work if it doesn't get there uh, by then. So if you complete your ballot after October 28th or you just don't want to mail it, you can drop it off at uh, any of the drop boxes 24 hours a day. And for this side of the county, that's really the La Plata County Administration Building here in 2nd and the La Plata County Clerk's Office in Durango. There's also a place in uh, Nashville and in Bayfield. Uh, Voters may vote in person at one of two voter service and polling centers in the county. Uh, they will be open through election day, the La Plata County Clerk's Office uh, beginning October 28th, and the Bayfield Town Hall beginning November 1st. Anybody can come in and vote either way. You can register and vote on the same day at any of these two places. Uh, voter registration information is also available outside. You can verify your registration. Uh, if you don't get a ballot right after the 11th of October, uh, verify your registration with the website uh, uh, govotecolorado.com. So when is election day? Very good. First Tuesday in November, November 5th. Please remember to vote. We want, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, the Durango Herald and Durango uh, Government Television, we really appreciate you coming and participating, and we really thank the school board candidates as well. And we are off air at this point.